Today I'm out here in Napa, California, taking a look at the 2019 Nissan Murano. Nissan has refreshed their mid-size two-row crossover for the 2019 model year to try and keep it current because this segment is really heating up. In 2019, we'll be getting an all-new Honda Passport, an all-new Chevy Blazer, and of course, that's on top of the recently redesigned Hyundai Santa Fe. In a nutshell, this segment is for shoppers that are looking for a little bit more room, especially a little bit more room in the back, a little bit more luxury, and perhaps a little bit more performance than is provided with the average compact crossover. But at the same time, they're not interested in stepping up to a three-row crossover like a Highlander or a Volkswagen Atlas. 2019 is a refresh, not a redesign for the Murano, so the basics of this are the same as the 2018 model year. But they have given it a new look up front. It is reminiscent of the old model, but they've actually changed the bumper. They've given us new full LED headlamps. These are LED reflectors and kind of this interesting style with swoops on the inside. And then we have LED fog lamps down below that are optional, well-integrated parking sensors, and then this strong chrome V-grille that we find in the rest of the Nissan lineup. At 192.4 inches long, this is notably longer than the average compact crossover in America, even though this is still a two-row vehicle. Most of that extra room goes to a combination of the hood and the interior passenger compartment right here, because the cargo area, as we'll see in a bit, is not actually that much larger than the average compact crossover. Now, some of that is due to the overall design, because we get this definitely raked rear window design like we see in the Lexus RX. And actually, this reminds me a little bit overall of the Lexus RX, just in a slightly more affordable package. In terms of overall comparative lengths, this is actually about the same length as a Toyota Highlander, and it's actually on the longer side for this two-row mid-size crossover segment. Moving to the rear, we find more LEDs. These are full LED tail lamp modules, not combination elements like we find in some of the less expensive vehicles out there. So even the amber turn signals that are flashing over here are LED reflector elements. We then have LED reflector elements over here on the lift gate as well. The overall style mirrors what was going on up front. It's not too big of a departure from the outgoing Murano, but there are a few tweaks here and there. Let me know what you think about the overall design down there in the comment section below. I'm not entirely sure what I think about these tail lamp modules that appear to bulge out a little bit from the body. The Murano is one of the first Nissans in America to get their new safety system that they're calling Safety Shield 360. This combines autonomous emergency braking, blind spot warning, lane keeping assistance, rear autonomous braking, auto high beams, and pedestrian detection. Now, unlike some of the competition, this safety system is not standard on the Murano, and I was actually a little bit surprised by that because basically these same technologies are standard on the Hyundai Santa Fe and the upcoming Honda Pilot. If you get the SL trim, it is available as an option package. If you get the Platinum trim, then it becomes standard on the Murano, and it works with the radar sensor down there at the bottom of the bumper and a camera right here behind the windscreen. In addition to that, you can also get a 360 degree camera system, which is one of the technologies that Nissan helped pioneer, and you'll find a little camera right there below the Nissan logo for that, as well as cameras underneath each of the side view mirrors. In addition to getting more room in your mid-size crossover, one of the other reasons to step up into a Murano is for more power under the hood, or if you simply want a V6 instead of an inline four-cylinder engine. Under here, we find one of Nissan's tried and true 3.5 liter V6 engines. It remains basically unchanged from 2018. It still produces 260 horsepower and 240 pound-feet of torque. It's mated by default to a continuously variable automatic transmission, and you can choose all-wheel drive if you want to. Regardless of whether you choose front-wheel drive or all-wheel drive, fuel economy comes in the same 24 miles per gallon combined. Nissan has a well-deserved reputation for making very comfortable seats, and the Murano is no exception. Although it is worth noting that these seats are not as adjustable as some of the competition. The electric lumbar support and even this essentially top-end trim is still a two-way variety, not a four-way variety, and we have a manual tilt telescopic steering column with a slightly smaller range of motion than in some of the competition. It's also worth noting that the passenger seat does not have the same range of motion as the driver's seat. It is lacking that two-way adjustable lumbar. But that said, I am still going to give these seats 9 out of 10 points because the overall design is very, very comfortable for my body shape. The rear passenger compartment is where the Murano really shines in this segment because at 82.3 inches of combined legroom, this rear passenger area is huge for this category. It is class leading. We also have an enormous amount of headroom. Our model does have the panoramic moonroof and I still have about an inch and a half of overall headroom left. 
The rear seats recline, as you'd expect in this category. There's a little bit of webbing right here on the seat side, and we do have a decent amount of recline motion. Scooting over to the middle seat, the rear bench is definitely wide and flat, making it a lot easier to put three adults across the back. And scooting all the way over to the right side of the vehicle, you can see that I still have a decent amount of legroom left over here. As I frequently say, one of the big reasons that you might want to consider getting a vehicle with more legroom like this is if you want to put especially rear-facing child seats behind taller adults up front, because extra combined legroom is going to give you more legroom for those rear-facing child seats. Rear seat passengers also enjoy a revised center console with a USB-C charging port, optional outboard seat heating, and of course two air vents at the bottom. It's clear that when designing the Murano, Nissan was going after a stylish exterior design and, of course, focusing on rear passenger accommodations. And that's why we seem to find a little bit less cargo room back here than in some of the larger options in this segment, like the Ford Edge. Now, the overall style here is important because the Ford Edge has a more vertical rear hatch, which allows it to swallow several cubic feet more than the Murano. At 32.1 cubic feet overall, this cargo area is actually smaller than some compact crossovers in America, which are actually smaller vehicles overall. Under the cargo area load floor, we do find a spare tire, so if that's something that you're looking for and you're not finding in the compact category, you will find it in the Murano. And it does look like there's enough room back here to put a full-size spare if you wanted to. Taking a quick look around the interior, keep in mind that we are in essentially a fully loaded model. We have this large panoramic moonroof, although it is not quite as large as some of the newer designs in this segment, so it doesn't go quite over there to the rear passenger's heads. The overall interior design is substantially similar to other Nissan products. We have height adjustable shoulder belts and two-way adjustable headrests. From this angle, you can see that the front seats are definitely thickly cushioned. We have some contrasting sections of material right here. So we have leather faces, imitation leather. This is sort of a sparkly material here, if you can't really see that on camera, and then white stitching around. The seat back and bottom cushions are perforated because seat ventilation is an option, although this particular vehicle does not have it. As you'd expect, out of a step above your average RAV4 or CRV, we find a few more soft touch materials on the front doors than we find in the less expensive vehicles. So a soft touch upper section there on the door, soft touch middle section. And then we get this sort of brushed steel imitation trim right here on the door. I'll zoom in so you can see that a little bit better. This is not real metal. This is actually sort of a lacquer coated plastic but it does imitate metal very well. And I think this is actually a little bit more convincing than some of the trims that we saw in the Murano cabin when this vehicle first launched a number of years ago. That trim goes from the doors on over to the dashboard in sort of a belt style motif right there circling around the dashboard. We then have a soft touch injection molded dashboard component. A fairly small bin style glove compartment. This would not be able to fit a larger tablet computer. And then a general dashboard design that definitely goes with the other Nissan crossovers in America. These two air vents right there, a standard 8-inch color infotainment screen right there, and then a two-zone automatic climate control below. At the bottom of the center console, we get the engine start-stop button, USB inputs for that multimedia system, including a USB-C media input, auxiliary input, 12-volt power port, small storage cubby right there with two large cup holders behind, and then a fairly traditional console shifter over here. This is also where we would find the controls for the heated or ventilated seats, depending on the options your vehicle was equipped with. Between the front seats, we find more of that imitation brushed steel trim right there on either side of this armrest. There's some soft touch material right there on either side for you to rest your arms on. This opens to reveal a very large and deep storage cubby. The instrument cluster remains basically the same as before. We have a tachometer on the left, speedometer on the right, and then a color multifunction display in the middle. This display gives us our pretty typical trip computer information as well as allows us to change certain vehicle settings and displays the status of the vehicle's active safety systems. Unfortunately, we don't get one of Nissan's newer steering wheels, so this is still a four-spoke design with some very minor sport grips up top. On the left side, we find the buttons to control that multifunction LCD right there, buttons to change the source, volume up, down, and then this toggle serves a few different functions. You can actually change tracks with it, or you can use it to interact with that multifunction LCD right there. We then have the controls for the radar adaptive cruise control over here on the right. Overall acceleration is pretty average for a higher horsepower option in this segment. We expect around the same 7.2 seconds that we saw in the last Murano that we drove. That's because nothing really under the hood has changed. We still have that same 3.5 liter V6. We have the same continuously variable transmission, basically. As with Nissan's other 
other CVTs, this transmission does imitate shifts as you accelerate. Unfortunately, that does detract from the overall acceleration score, however. This would actually be faster 0 to 60 if it just varied the ratios like CVTs used to. Unfortunately, a lot of people out there like those imitation shifts, and that's why Nissan is doing them in their latest vehicles. In terms of overall acceleration figures, that puts this in square competition to the 2-liter turbo that we find optional under the hood of the Hyundai Santa Fe and standard in the Ford Edge. This should be right around the same 0-60 to 60 time as a base Jeep Grand Cherokee as well. We don't have official braking scores yet, but based on the curb weight of the Murano, which is on the low side for this segment, and the fact that we have 235 with tires on this particular model, I'm going to guess this is going to be around the 120-foot range. Overall handling ability and handling feel is pretty comparable to the top-end trims of the Hyundai Santa Fe and those base trims of the Ford Edge. Keep in mind that the Hyundai Santa Fe starts considerably less than this, so you have to work your way on up to the higher-end trims of the Santa Fe in order to get the same kind of acceleration and handling ability that we find in the Murano. That's part of why the Murano is more expensive than that Hyundai model. We have electric power steering just like most new cars, so there's not a whole lot of steering feel going on, but the overall steering is fairly precise. If you want the best overall feel, then I suggest stepping up into the all-wheel drive model because it does help reduce the amount of torque steer that we find in vehicles like this. Now, we don't have quite as much torque out of this engine as we find in those 2-liter turbo competitors, but we also don't have any turbo lag as a result. The Murano has long been known for a quiet and comfortable ride, and that continues for the 2019 model year vehicle. Again, these seats are some of the most comfortable that you'll find in this particular segment, and the overall ride is very well polished, even though we have the up-level larger wheels. Now, if you want the smoothest ride, I would suggest getting the base model with those 18-inch wheels and tires. One of the advantages to the overall drivetrain design in the Murano is high fuel economy. And you should expect notably higher fuel economy in this than comparable versions of especially the Hyundai Santa Fe. The Santa Fe feels fresher overall, I think, than the Murano, but it does fall behind in terms of overall fuel economy, especially if you get the optional 2-liter turbo. It's been something that Hyundai has struggled with over the last few years, is overall fuel economy. And this will be several miles per gallon better, whether you're talking about the front-wheel drive version or the all-wheel drive version. It's worth noting that that Hyundai Santa Fe in top-end trim with all-wheel drive and the 2-liter turbo actually gets the same kind of fuel economy that you find in the Ford Edge ST, and the Edge ST is considerably more powerful. This, on the other hand, is considerably more fuel efficient. So if you're taking a look at those Ford models, this is going to give you much better fuel efficiency for similar performance to the base 2-liter turbo and definitely better fuel efficiency than the Edge ST. The Murano isn't about overt sportiness, although this is definitely faster than the Nissan Rogue. Instead, this is about being comfortable, being quiet, being more spacious on the inside. And that's why a lot of people seem to be cross-shopping this with the Lexus RX, because the two vehicles actually remind me a great deal of each other. The overall way that the Murano is tuned is very Lexus-like in that respect. We have a relatively quiet cabin, we have very comfortable seats, and we have that same spaciousness that we find in the Lexus RX. If you're after something that's a little bit more dynamic, then there are other alternatives. If you're looking for something that's a little bit less expensive, again, there are other options as well. But if you're looking for something that's, again, a little bit bigger than the average compact crossover, a little bit quieter and a little bit more comfortable, it's hard to go wrong with the Murano. And now to the nitty gritty. You'll be able to buy one of these, we're told, in December, so basically right now, and they will start at $31,270. That'll get you the S trim with front wheel drive and cloth seats. The minimum all-wheel drive price is $32,870, and if you want leather inside the cabin, and you probably will, you'll have to step up to the SL trim, right like this one, for $39,230. If you want all the options, the Platinum all-wheel drive model starts at $45,130. That puts the overall base price of the 2019 Murano about $6,000 higher than the Hyundai Santa Fe, but remember that we get a standard V6 engine under the hood, not the four-cylinder engine that we find in the Hyundai Santa Fe. Now, on the downside, we don't have the active safety technologies that you do find in that Hyundai standard on the Murano. You won't find those optional until the SL trim and standard until the Platinum trim, which I do think is a little bit of a pity. But we do get that V6 engine standard, the high fuel economy, and some of the basic active safety features in even that base trim. Now, on the other hand, this is significantly less expensive than a Lexus RX350, which is actually a frequent cross shop with the Murano. This is about $12,000 less. You will, of course, have to wait until we can get our hands on the Murano for a complete week in order for us to do our usual battery of comparisons. However, I can say right off the bat that if you liked the Murano before, you're going to love the 2019 Murano. We get all those added safety features available in the top end trims. We finally get the inclusion of Apple CarPlay and Android Auto in the cabin, something that a lot of people have really been looking for. 
and everything that was already great about the Murano is still there. It's still very comfortable on the inside, the back seats are still very, very generous, and we get more power than we find in Nissan's smaller crossovers as well. Performance is definitely a step above the Rogue, so if you want more room for child seats in the back, more comfortable seats, if you want more power under the hood, this is going to be an excellent option. But if you want even more power than this, then that is available in this segment as well, in entries like the Ford Edge. And the Edge versus the Murano, that's where things start to get complicated a little bit, because the Edge doesn't have the high fuel economy we find in this vehicle, but it does give us significantly more power and better handling. Be sure and let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below, and let me know what you would pick if you were shopping in this two-row crossover segment. Would you get something like that Hyundai Santa Fe? Would you get the Nissan Murano for its more comfortable and more spacious interior? Or would you get something like a Ford Edge, even though it is getting a little bit old in this segment? And really, really importantly, let me know, would you wait for something like the Honda Passport, which I will be driving in January? So be sure and stay tuned for that video as well. In the meantime, click that subscribe button if you haven't already done so. Click on up there to the top of your screen if you want to support this channel, and I'll see you later.